All right, I think we can get started. Um, so hello everyone, welcome to ASIC seminar series. This is John, the seminar coordinator. And together with me is Ms. Kathy Medley, um, who is our communication and IT specialist. And um, today we are excited to have our speaker um, joining us from the UIUC and our um, director, Dr. Um, Anna Williams and our associate director, Rob Ferrero, um, also joining us. Um, as you might know, we will have a new book debut um, from the speaker. So I will need Kathy to um, uh, talk about it. Um, Kathy, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thanks for attending our seminar. So um, Professor Robert is very generously giving away a copy of his new book, which is called Natural Disasters, Hazards of the Dynamic Earth. Um, one seminar attendee gets the chance to uh, win the book. All you have to do is sign up to a Google form. There's still time to do that. If you go to go.umd.edu slash Rauber book, um, it's in the chat now as well. And just, it's like your email and your name, um, and then just a, a consent form and then sign up and then I'll announce it right before the Q and A section once the seminar is over. But Ellen, please proceed with introducing our speaker. Okay, great. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, it may be that our today's seminar speaker needs no introduction, but I'll do one anyway. It's a true pleasure to have Professor Robert Robert from the director of the School of Earth, Society and Environment at the University of Illinois as our seminar speaker today. Professor Robert is an expert in the fields of mesoscale meteorology, radar meteorology and precipitation physics. And he has a distinguished and I must say amazing record of field campaigns publications, teaching, and books. His recent publications include work on mixed phase heterogeneity of clouds over the Southern Ocean, seeded orographic clouds, and aerosols from biomass burning in Central Asia. We're delighted to have Professor Robert with us today, and he will speak about fine scale structure of snowstorms, motivations for NASA impacts. Please take the, uh, take the screen, Professor Robert. Hey, can everybody see the screen? Yep. Okay, let me move this little window up in the corner. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's uh, a joy to be able to, to talk to you about uh, one of my passions, which is uh, winter storms. Uh, I'd like to start off by acknowledging all the people who did all the hard work. Uh, these are all my students, all the pictures here uh, that have uh, contributed to material that I'm gonna show you today. And I also note at the bottom the fantastic team of NASA impacts investigators from many institutions uh, who are all working together to uh, work on the uh, studies of, of uh, north, Northeast cyclones. Okay, well, I'd like to start with, uh, with a picture. Uh, and this is a, a picture that you've probably seen somewhere. These are the blindfolded scientists and the elephant. Uh, and uh, you can see that each of the uh, each of the scientists are hanging on to a, a different part of the elephant and trying to interpret or making hypotheses about what's going on. And uh, some think it's a, a snake or a spear, depending on the touch in the ear, it's think it's a fan or a wall or a rope. Well, what does this have to do with winter storms? Uh, well, if we look at cyclones and we ask ourselves, how do we observe these, these, uh, these cyclones and phenomena? First of all, we have to deal with many scales. We're dealing with a synoptic scale of a large system uh, that covers sometimes a half a continent or even less. Uh, and uh, yet we're dealing with individual snowflakes and, and aerosol and everything. So there's a wide range of scales. So how, how do we view these? Well, if we look at a, uh, a, a clouds, these represent, a, let's say, a cross section through, a, through the comma head of the, the upper part of the cyclone. The first thing we do is we use uh, ground-based radars. Ground-based radars typically in scanning mode, uh, for example, the WSR-88D network. And with those scans, we often see uh, uh, linear precipitation bands and so on. A second way we, we look at it and uh, is with a vertically pointing radar. Uh, and this radar can be on the ground, for example, looking up. Then we watch the storm move over a particular location and we try to interpret what the storm structure is based on how we see it move over. We also look at it from space uh, from a, with a range of different types of satellites. Uh, and uh, we, we launch ray uh, up into the storm and try to understand the thermodynamic structure. 
and uh, and now in and with NASA particularly, we're we're flying through the storm. I show the P3 aircraft here, uh, but uh, actually the NOAA P3, but that's a it, you get the idea. Uh, and uh, on that on on those aircraft, we can also have radars that look down and do uh, cross sections. So in a sense, we're like the scientists, uh, blindfolded scientists looking at the elephant. Each of us has our instruments that we're trying to understand the dynamics, microphysics, and overall uh, structure and evolution of these cyclones. So, uh, and then finally, I should mention, we model them, right? And so we, uh, we, we have models that uh, run at various resolutions and we try to understand them that way as well. Okay, so what I'd like to do is, is take you on a tour of what we've learned in the last decade or so uh, prior to impacts uh, that have, uh, I would say, uh, made us try, to, have given us different interpretations of what these winter storms are like. Uh, and those interpretations don't always make sense in terms of each other. You know, we're kind of like the blindfolded scientists and the elephant trying to understand what it is. So let's start off with uh, the ground-based radars. Okay, so uh, th this is uh, the wsr 88 d network, for example. And when we look at the uh, these winter storms, this is a storm on the on the east coast here. Uh, we'll often see structures like you see on the left. Uh, there's a, you can see there's long linear banded features that are very common. Uh, sometimes it's just one. There's one very strong band like you might see uh, on this. Uh, let's see if you can see my cursor right in here. Okay, uh, but oftentimes there's multi bands. You see these other other bands as well that that develop in here and and they evolve with time and uh, sometimes strengthen or weaken and so on. Uh, and, and what we try to do, and, and when we look at these, is try to interpret why these banded features occur and uh, relate the thermodynamic and dynamic environment of bands to their structural evolution. Keeping in mind, uh, when we try to interpret the thermodynamics, uh, we really have you know just soundings in a couple locations along here and not much over the ocean uh, that are actual data and everything else we, we have to get from uh, model simulations. All right, now, if we look at these storms from a different perspective, and now what I'm going to show you here, okay, this is a, if you look up in the corner, you can see there's a, a cyclone, uh, and I'm showing you a cross section right now along the white line. So we're going across the comma head of the cyclone, and here I've superimposed on this diagram uh, the equivalent potential temperature and uh, did some quick frontal analysis on here. And the area where you see the radar echo in here is the area where uh, is on this red line in here. And this is where we flew an aircraft that had a W band radar that pointed both up and down in the vertical. Uh, and, uh, and you can see just in this area that you really see two different structures. You see in this region right in here on the left, uh, you can see this kind of uh, more, what might call, call a stratiform area. And then you have to see these tower, tower like features in here. Now keep in mind, we're looking at a cross section that goes almost 1500 kilometers. I want to take that cross section, and put it up in the corner up in here, and I'm going to expand it uh, to show this a little more. Now you notice the stratiform region over in here, but take a look at the top. You see all these features up at the top, and you can see that every one of these features is producing a plume of ice that is falling out of the storm. Okay, okay we're going to call these generating cells. I'm going to come back to these in a minute. Uh, and then all of a sudden you see there's a transition zone right in here, and then we get these more towery looking features in here, uh, and this is still a fairly long cross section. We're looking at about, you know, 500 kilometers across here right now, and you see these little tower features. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to blow one of those up, okay, and we're going to look over here, uh, and hang on, I got a little window in, in the way I can't see around. There you go. Uh, and, oops, hang back. Hang on. Go back. There you go. All right, now we're looking at one of these features over in here. Come on, there you go. Okay, so, and if you look here, this is actually developing convection. These are the radial velocities. These reds are the updrafts. And in these storms, we see velocities. So this is winter storms now, this is snowing, okay? You see velocities in here of updrafts uh, on the order of about four to six meters per second. And sometimes, and we flew through these and measured them, okay? And this is actually a, a convective cell that is kind of 
fuzzed out now and, and it's going stratiform and you can see the plumes coming out of this thing right uh now these these guys in here actually have velocities that are strong enough upward velocities are strong enough uh, that they can uh, they can start charging so this is an example over here from a profiler oops okay. i want to try to use this cursor here all right uh, and these velocity we're looking at vertical velocities in here okay and uh, these velocities like i said are about six meters per second if you look down the bottom this is actually from a field mill near the ground and these these are uh charge uh, charge variations at the surface and in fact we had lightning strikes very close by right in the snow so what we're seeing here is elevated convection this is above the front completely above the front you see these convective cells that are going off uh, particularly on the south side of the storm or on the north side, uh, you know, we're seeing more, more stratiform, but with these uh, generating cells at the cloud top. So a very complicated structure. Uh, so let's ask a question. I just showed you one storm. Are these, are these reflectivity structures that we're seeing across the common head of cyclones common, or is this just one unusual storm? Well, uh, on the top here is the storm I just showed you. Okay. And on the bottom is, is a completely different storm that we flew with a uh, with the NCAR G5 aircraft along the east coast of the United States. And if you look at this, you can see there's a convective region to the south down in here. There's a convective region here and then more of a stratiform region in here and in here. And you can see these plumes of ice crystals coming down from the top uh, in both of these storms. So this idea that we have a convective region in a stratiform region with a convective region to the south and the stratiform region to the north uh, is, is something that uh, seems to be a reasonably common feature. And if, but if you look at the structure of these, these cells, uh, they, they, in, they themselves are complicated. And uh, so we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at these in a lot of detail just to give you some idea of the, the complexity that we're, we're dealing with when we try to understand winter storms. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about before we uh, take a tour of that are what are what are called cloud top generating cells. Now, cloud top generating cells uh, look something like this. First, let me show you this on the left. Here's a this is actually an Alberta Clipper type storm going over the Midwest here. Mouse uh, anymore because it keeps doing things that I don't want it to do. Okay, and. Uh, and you look at it, it's it's not that exciting, right? It just looks like a kind of a weak winter storm. But take a look at it when you look at it with a vertical profile. Now, the profile is located, located where the square is here. And uh, the storm's moving over it. And this is the reflectivity at the top. And this is the radial velocity from the bottom. And you can see these, these hair-like features in the reflectivity at the cloud top. Look at these. Every one of them is producing a plume. You can see the plumes coming down out of them. They're being sheared by the wind. And if you look at the bottom, you can see in here, these are the upward velocities. Uh, we're measuring velocities of anywhere between one and three meters per second, all across the cloud top region. Now you say, are these really real? Well, let me, let me uh, just ask you to think about your last experience flying uh, over a cloud where your aircraft descends into the cloud. And if you're like me, you know, when you descend into what happens, the first thing you do is hit the cloud, boom, 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 you start bouncing around, right? And then as you descend into the cloud, that weakens and then the turbulence kind of dies down. This is exactly what we're seeing here in the data. We're seeing these uh, cloud top generating cells. So what do we know about these? Well, if you, you know, uh, if you uh, actually look back in, in time, uh, this is me over here. This is 1953. I was born in 1951. And uh, this was when the first paper came out on this. It was by uh, uh, J.S. Marshall. Uh, there's papers that go back way into the 50s where they've talked about these circulations. Okay, so this is not new. Okay, but what, what is new uh, is they're everywhere. We see these in all the storms we're looking at. I've seen these over in orographic storms over the mountains of the Western United States. I've seen them in, in, in storms over the Southern Ocean. And we see them in, in storms very commonly, uh, in virtually everywhere I've looked. Uh, you can see them right here, for example. Look at the plumes coming out of cloud top. 
the cloud top is a prodigious source of ice crystals. Okay, and and these these cells, these these little convective cells that develop at the cloud top, are where our snow is coming from, uh, and and they're, they're it's just a very common feature. So why are they there? That's a good question. That's, and and we've looked at that. Okay, so I, I just got a couple different pictures of them over here. You can see the, the, there's some up in here. Here's some in another storm. This is yet an, yet another storm down in here. So I had one of my students, Jason Keeler. Uh, as for his PhD, modeled these, these uh, generating cells. We used a, a, a weather research and forecasting model and in in an idealized uh, high resolution simulations. Uh, and what we did is we uh, we created different environments. So we 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 had first thing we we turned on radi nighttime radiation. We did daytime radiation. We did no radiation. Uh, we looked at uh, environments that are stable, neutral, and unstable. These are all controlled simulations. And we looked at shear from zero to 10 meters per second. And this diagram on the right kind of summarizes what Jason learned. And, uh, and this is published in about three different papers now. But if you look uh, look here, this is, this is a case with no shear and uh, weak instability at the cloud top. And you see the cells form kind of like almost Bernard type convection. As the shear is increased, they they go linear. Of course, now when we fly across these things, we don't see that linearity because we only see one dimension. Uh, under neutral conditions, uh, we still see these cells develop, and the reason is because radiative cooling at cloud top. Radiative cooling at top, cloud top drives the storm, drives these cells because you get cooling uh, at the cloud top, and it's warmer down below, and then you get overturning that occurs. Uh, it's kind of like upside down convection, if you like to call it that. Uh, and so we see these in the model, these would develop uh, whether the air was stable or unstable, uh, provided we had nighttime radiation. If we if we went to daytime, they were weaker uh, and no radiation, they just disappeared. The radiation was very important in the simulations. Uh, and that, you know, we know that these cells are, are, are have, a, have a lot of things that drive them, shear, instability, and, and radiative cooling all together. Okay, so. Let's put all that together now. I've, I've described a couple of different storm systems to you. And now what I'd like to do is I'd like to take you on a tour of a single northeast snowstorm that we observed. This is prior to impacts where we flew uh, along a line between approximately uh, Chesapeake Bay and Portland, Maine. We went up and back like this three times. Okay? So I'm going to take you on a tour of the data that came out of there. And uh, what I want, uh, my goal here is to have you uh, say to yourself, man, these storms are almost impossible to figure out because they're so complicated. Okay, so I'm gonna show you some of that complexity and what we're trying to do in impacts uh, to understand these, these complexities and circulations. All right, so this is the plane we flew. This is uh, the uh, NCAR G5 aircraft. Uh, I, I managed to get NSF to give me permission to fly over one storm. Uh, and, uh, and and so this was it. So we'll take a look at the storm. All right, so here's where we flew. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to overlay on the uh, radar data that we collected uh, analyses from a wharf simulation uh, so that we, we, we're using that as a basis for understanding the thermodynamic structure of the storm. Okay, so I won't get into all the details of how we did this, but basically the data that you see overlaid on there are from a wharf simulation. Okay, so let's, let's take this slow. Let's go up here. This is leg one. Okay, leg one, uh, so on the south end down here is uh, around somewhere around Philadelphia, say. Uh, here's, here's Portland, Maine up in here. So this is a fairly long cross section. Okay, And uh, this is actually what I showed you before. This is kind of the convective region. Here's the stratiform region here. But now what we're gonna do is we're gonna zoom in. So every underneath here, you're looking at the radar reflectivity. This is W band reflectivity. And the analysis you see on the top diagram is temperature. So uh, the zero degree isotherm is a stark black line. Everything on above that and to this side is cold. You can see there's an inflection point in here. I've indicated the warm front. The front is actually a frontal zone across in here, but I'm showing the top of the frontal zone as we go across. Now you see there's region A, region B, and region C here. 
we're going to take a look at each one of these. So I want you first to just zoom in and look at this little area in here. So oh, it's hard, you know, hard to figure out what's going on. We're going to blow it up. Okay, so now we're looking at region A. Oops, come on. There you go. And uh, on the left, I have reflectivity. On the right, I have radial velocity. This is a vertical radial velocity from the aircraft moving over. I plotted on here, I've overlaid the wind in the cross section. So this is the wind along the cross section. And I'll just note that there's a 24 meter per second wind here, 29 meter per second there, 21 there. And as a result, this is leading to this shear in this plume that's coming out down here. Now you notice over here, we've got some higher velocities. Okay, and these are, this is elevated convection. This region L2 is actually a region where uh, the equivalent potential temperature is decreasing with height. I have plotted on here. So we, we have this region of elevated convection that is producing a plume of ice, which is then being sheared downward to the melting level. This is the melting level here. That's a zero degree isotherm. Uh, and then rain is falling down in here. Okay, so, so that's what's going on in this little area here, A. Let's move over to area B and see uh, what the structure looks like over there. Now here we are in region B. Uh, if you blow up this scene right in here, uh, you can see these uh, what look like generating cells, uh, each producing a plume of ice and the ice is being sheared on and kind of being melded together down right above the zero degree isotherm in here. Uh, and you can see these plumes, look how far they go. I mean, they, get, they really get sheared off as they come down. Uh, and you can see, if you look at the radial velocity, each one of these is associated with maybe a one to two meter per second updraft sitting right at the cloud top and emerging from this very narrow, stable layer, unstable layer that you see right in here. Now, as the, of course, as all this falls down, it falls through the zero degree isotherm. That's where you see these increase in speed here with the rain. Okay, but if you look at this in detail, take a look at the rain, uh, the way it's structured. Oops, sorry. Uh, you can see these little cells down here. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's like heavier rain, lighter rain, heavier. And this is actually freezing rain because it's melted at the uh, and then fallen back into colder air. So this is freezing rain, but you're seeing it is intense, less intense, intense, less intense, and so on. Uh, as it forms these cellular structures that are associated with the flows down near the surface. Very complicated. Okay, we're gonna move over to region C. We can get over in the stratiform region C, come on. Okay, over in C here. Uh, and uh, well, it kind of looks stratiform. You don't see a whole lot going on, right? I mean, it's pretty uniform echoes all the way down. Not a lot of structure, except really down in the boundary layer when you get down in here. But, uh, you know, this is a, just a pretty stratiform cloud. This was daytime, by the way, uh, that we flew. And you don't see many generating cells up at the top of this uh, compared to what we see sometimes at night. All right, so now we're going to head back. Okay, so now we're flying back uh, from Maine back to, to Philadelphia. And I'm just going to focus on two areas that I found particularly interesting. That's region D here and uh, region D and region E. And we'll go to region D first. Uh, and what I've done here. It's hard to see the reflectivity underneath this plot. So I plotted the low level reflectivity right up in here. The main thing I want you to take away from that is look at the wave structure in here. See the wave structure and the reflectivity? Well, that's associated with these variations in radial velocity that you see in here. Look at this up, down, up, down. These are waves that are in the shear zone. Now, if you look at the winds down in here, uh, the winds, there's almost like 40 meters per second shear right across this front. And, and as a result, we're getting some sort of wave wave structures, turbulent wave structures that are developing on the front down in here. Uh, and uh, you know how this all influences precipitation. Uh, if you look at the reflectivity, you can see it. It's, it is having an effect on on the way the reflectivity is structuring itself. But the main thing you see these long streamers in here, and those are associated with these sheared plumes that are coming out further up in the cloud top. You can see these, for example, coming up in here and down across the front, down in there. Very complicated structure. Uh, let's go to region E, which is another interesting location. Uh, now we're zooming in on, if I can get my mouse to work here, right up in here, you see these plumes. Uh, and uh, look at these things. I mean, there's a cell here, a cell there, 
another cell in here. You can see these upward velocities in here are pretty strong right at the cloud top and it's unstable. Uh, and then they produce these plumes of ice that are just, you know, they're they're trailing down as basically the wind's moving very fast up at the top and they're being invected along. And the stuff that's falling is falling into slower moving air and le leading to these long trails. So when you think of a precipitation band that you're viewing at a low level with a with with an, a radar, you may be looking at ice that fell from 50, 150 kilometers away and coming down into the spot, into the region where you're observing it. It makes it very complicated to interpret where things are happening. Uh, go over to region F over here. This is a, this is really an amazing region. If you look right in here, can't see there, but let me show you what it looks like. Take a look at the circulations. We've got these wave circulations at the cloud top. You can see them in the reflectivity. They jump off the page. Look over in here. These are the these are the vertical velocities. Uh, blue is up and red is down. And you can see there's a very strong wave type motion that is occurring in this region in here. And this is all just in one little part of the storm, right? So it's very complicated structures. And you can see these plumes of ice then coming out, coming down through and melting through the zero degree isotherm right there. Okay, and finally, this is going back north. I just want to take you to a couple other regions real quick. This is region G up in here. Uh, and again, you can see these, look at these plumes come down and turn off the, you know, because of the shear, shear off in one direction or another. Really strong wind shear right in here. You're looking at the wind component in the cross section. Winds go from 17 meters per second to the left, to 30 meters per second in the right over a distance of a kilometer. 47 meters per second shear. Uh, per kilometer shear right across there, okay? and uh, and so so you know uh, some of the effects of that when you look at this one, this is region H on the way back. Uh, you can see that right along this front, uh, I put the reflectivity again, the low level reflectivity up here. You see all these little cells that develop, and they're associated with these updrafts and downdrafts that are occurring in this shear zone uh, that are uh, basically a result of the shear. And you can see the effect on the precipitation. Uh, these are what you're looking at here, are radial velocities, but you can see that they're organized in these columns uh, that, uh, you know, so imagine if you could drive through here real fast, it hit heavy rain, light rain, heavy rain, light rain as you went along. Very complicated, right? Uh, keep in mind, this is all one storm, right? This is one cyclone we're looking at. And all these complexities I just showed you are in one cyclone. So this is what we're dealing with an impact, you know, we're trying to figure this out. And our main conundrum we're trying to deal with in impacts uh, is, is the two different ways I've showed you we look at storms. One is when we look at it with, we look at these storms with uh, radar, uh, ground-based radar, we tend to see these banded structures uh, and we're trying to understand how we get single bands and multi bands and what are the, what are the dynamics and particularly the microphysics associated with this. When I get the microphysics, this is where we really don't know a whole lot at all. We have, we have almost no information at all about the microphysical structure of East Coast cyclones. We just haven't flown through them to get this information. Uh, and, uh, and then if we look at these in the vertical, we see structures like this. Okay. So the question is, how do these structures become these structures? Because it's, it's the same storm system we, we're going to look at, you know, whether we look, it's just, it's looking at the elephant, right? We put the, we put the, the radar looking horizontally. We tend to see these features. We look at it vertically. We tend to see these features, and so we sit there and scratch our heads and say, "Okay, how do we how do we resolve these uh, these different ways that we look at storms, and 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 is this tied to the microphysical evolution? Is this tied to the storm dynamics? Is the storm tied to both? Uh, you know, how what role does kinematics versus dynamics play? You know, whether you have deformation flow or whether you have frontogenesis, all these questions underlie the, uh, trying to understand the mysteries of these storms." So that leads me to impacts, uh, and impacts is our, our goal, if I could uh, state it in kind of a simple way, is integration. Okay, so, uh, you know, where, where we look at individual pieces of that elephant and make our hypotheses, what we're trying to do is take all these pictures together and, and take all these different ways in which we look at storms and integrate them into a single coherent picture of how these storms evolve. So that's the goal of impacts is this, this integration of all these these instruments instruments and instrumentation uh, and model simulations and so on into a coherent picture that connects the various structures we see at different scales and in different ways to one another. 
So what I'd like to do in my remaining time uh, is, is to take you for a, for a walk through the first major storm we had on the East Coast. Uh, and this was in the uh, 2020 season. We were very fortunate uh, that we managed to get the impacts project in in January and February of 2020, just before COVID hit. And we were, uh, we, we were able to complete that first field phase. And so I'm gonna show you some data now from one of the storms and some of the ways that we're tying things together here. All right, so uh, a little bit about impacts for those of you who are not familiar with it. Uh, impacts involves two aircraft. Uh, the first is the NASA ER-2 aircraft. Uh, on the ER-2, we have a, a cloud radar system. This is the W-band radar. Uh, it's vertically pointing and uh, uh, coherent polarimetric Doppler. Uh, we have a cloud physics LIDAR, uh, which is a backscatter LIDAR. Uh, we have uh, the HIRAP, which is a dual frequency KA and KU band radar. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, two radiometers, uh, Amper and Cosmere. And finally, we have XRAD, which is a, a, an X band uh, nose mounted uh, radar that has scanning and nadir pointing uh, ability. So we have lots of radars and, and LIDAR and other remote sensors on the NASA ER 2. The ER 2 flies uh, above the storm well above the storm, typically somewhere on the order of about 50,000 feet or so. Now, the other aircraft we're flying is the NASA P-3. NASA P-3 is a microphysics uh, uh, aircraft on, on, on this mission. Uh, we have it loaded with microphysics probes that cover the full spectrum of particles from, uh, from cloud droplets all the way up to, to big snowflakes. Uh, and uh, they include uh, the, the uh, Nezerov probe, the cloud droplet spectral probe, the King probe, and the HVPS. If you're not familiar with these, these are basically either measure particle size distributions or integrated values like liquid water content from those size distributions. We also are dropping drop sons, but only over water. We haven't done many so far because the storms have been over land. Uh, and then we have a, a bunch of other probes that uh, basically are all designed to measure particle size distributions and image particles both as, uh, as, as shadow images like the optical ray probes and also as like hologram images where you could actually see a real picture of it. Uh, okay, so let's put all those up there. So where are we flying? Well, we fly to Wallops, uh, Wallops Island with the P3. That's the yellow circles. Uh, and I've indicated uh, how far, how long it takes us to get out to a certain distance there. Uh, and then the, the uh, ER2 is flying out of, out of it's been one or the locations vary a bit from year to year, but they're basically out of Georgia. We have to go far enough south because we don't, you can't take off in these strong storm winds with the ER2. The idea is to get the storm, is to get the uh, aircraft on top of one another. So this is kind of an idealized looking diagram of how we might fly. We do it differently depending on different missions, but I'll just show you this here. The idea is to have the ER2 flying up high Okay, back and forth along a track over the storm. And then the P3 sampling the storm at various elevations. So it might, might come in and go down and then come back up again. But keep in mind that this is, this is complicated. The storm doesn't like to sit still. Uh, it, uh, you know, it's evolving, it's intensifying, it's moving. Uh, so there's, so it, one of the complexities that we have to deal with in, uh, in impacts is we have to uh, try to take into account the, uh, the evolution of the storm at the same time uh, where the aircrafts are evolving by moving around in the storm. We're also launching Raywinsons and we have ground-based radars as well, uh, particularly from Stony Brook. They've got a, a suite of different remote sensors that they're, they're deploying. Uh, and then we're sending up Raywinsons, uh, both from National Weather Service offices, but uh, University of Illinois has a Raywinson team uh, and Stony Brook has a Raywinson team that are launching we may have some others in the future deployments. Uh, if we're over the ocean, we can also drop drops on from the P3 when we're at, from higher altitude. So the, these the, uh, with, associated with that too, we have all the WSR 88D radars. Uh, and uh, you know, so I just showed you on this diagram here, these, these blue lines show the different uh, scanning angles that the, the, the radar might have. So these are the tools plus models that we have to put this uh, story together about these storms. So let me take you on a tour of one storm. Uh, this is the February 7th event. 
this event occurred in western uh, part of the uh, New England area. Well, it occurred over a larger area, but uh, you can see this is snow over in here, and then kind of snow accumulation disappears. This was all rain over on this side and here. We're just showing the snow accumulation on this diagram. Where we flew is this red line here. Okay. I'm going to show you a cross section or two that extends a bit further, goes all the way over here from Michigan out into the Atlantic. So we'll be looking at both near end cross sections here as well as a longer one. All right, so here's the storm. Uh, nice uh, northeast snowstorm. Uh, it dropped, uh, we had, to, had something like 12 millibar drop during the time we were flying. This is 982 millibars. Uh, this is near the early part of the storm. Uh, cold front and warm front out here. There was also kind of an Arctic frontal boundary that wrapped into this region in here as well, some colder air coming out of Canada. Uh, and here's the jet overhead. There was a, a nice merger of subtropical and uh, polar jet uh, that uh, with a jet streak that triggered this, this particular event. All right, so this is a complicated diagram. Uh, let me, uh, give me a second to move. I can see you guys here. I gotta move, move you out of the way so I can see who I'm looking at. All right, uh, and uh, so on the left, uh, what we have is the, uh, WSR 88D radar reflectivity, okay? And, uh, and that is this at 1400, 1500, 1600, 1700. We've overlaid the uh, kinematic front of Genesis on. That's what's, there's these lines in here. So you can see there's kind of a band uh, in here and maybe you can call it a, maybe a band in there. It's kind of hard to identify. So with this, this is the area we were interested in. Um, on uh, these diagrams, these two, this is the uh, radar correlation coefficient. It's very good at identifying where the, the uh, rain snow line is, which is right about here. This is rain over here, snow over here, and this is where we were flying right along this leg in here. Now, the uh, one of the issues we have is trying to coordinate, of course, the ER2 and the P3 to get them right on top of one another. So the ER2 actually arrived early on this storm. Uh, these are the these are radar cross sections from the XRAD of the uh, and the, and the, the P3. I'm sorry, the ER2 made six passes. Uh, the first pass was was long, the second shorter. This is where we got in line with the P3. And then these three aligned with the or coordinated with the P3. On the left side, this is from the 88D. This is a composite called the MRMS composite. We get this from the University of Oklahoma. So I've plotted this over the whole time period so you can just see the sequence of the storm. What I want you to notice is on the left side, you can see the storm is weakening with time. Uh, uh, it's just basically, uh, by the time we get from here to here, you can see that the storm was mainly over on this side, or at least the snow. That's where we were flying on the P3. So the P3 legs are in here. And there's a lot of details on here you don't need to worry about, but basically the P3 was flying at different levels. All right, so just to, so you can see the sampling issue, we're trying to put these stories together. Uh, the ER2 had to go home right after this point here. So, so this is this is the kind of the and the complications we have to deal with. So here's the weak band right in there, and there's a melting signature in here, and there's the snow, and there's the rain. Okay, and there's six legs of ER2. P3 starts there, and the P3 has seven legs. All right, so let's 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 uh, jump in here now and take a look at the storm. Uh, this is the XRAD ER2 cross section. What I want you to notice right away: here's the stratiform region over in here again. Here's the convective region over here. Somewhere along in there is about where they transition. Okay. Uh, if the band that we see at the surface. On in here, okay, and it's a weak band. This is not a strong band, but it's a weak band that we see here. Actually shows up in the XRAD as this region right in here. We're gonna explore this a little bit in a minute, see what's going on in here. Okay, so, uh, and then out in here, you can see there's a radar bright band. This is the melting level right there. And then the melting level just dives to the ground in here, right? So, so this all area is, is rain. Uh, and these echoes that we see in here, these strong echoes on the 88D are actually melting signatures as the beam is passing through this region of the uh, of the bright band, All right? So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna overlay on the data, uh, a um, this is from the uh, RAP model reanalysis. 
Uh, you'll notice I've put some fronts on here. Uh, think of these as the top of the frontal zone. Okay, so frontal zone really extends through here. Uh, and I'm just indicating the top of it. And then there's a second front. This was that Arctic uh, for air. And you can see there's a frontal zone. You can see this. Oh, by the way, this is the equivalent potential temperature we're looking at here. So the equivalent potential temperature gradient is very strong in there, very strong in there. Uh, and uh, the frontal kind of sits right in here and right in here. Uh, and uh, so, and, and also, if you look in this region right here, uh, you can note that uh, this there's some area in here where the equivalent potential temperature actually decreases with height. This is an area of weak instability right in here, and that's associated in, uh, with the convective cells that we see. All right, if we overlay the uh, kinematic frontogenesis calculated from the model, see it aligns very well with the front, uh, the frontal zone, uh, and uh, it, this particular area uh, lines up with this banded feature we see, but we got other areas back in here that don't align with much of anything. So, uh, so you know, one of the things we're trying to explore is whether uh, this really matters to, to this feature we see in here, or why is that feature there? Why do we see that strong reflectivity? If we look at the model vertical motion, you can see that the air is actually rising over top of this frontal frontal surface. This is from the model, uh, and uh, you, you can see. You can really see the difference when you look at the, you look at a, a model that you know you get this kind of smooth rising motion in here. Compare that to the structures that we see in here, where you see this much much more complicated flows. All right, so uh, interesting. We we got the idea to take a look and see where this air was coming from, uh, and I wanted to just point out this over over here. Uh, you see these colors here correspond to different areas of the storm. So uh, air down low up in this region in here actually started over the Atlantic, came around and came around to the backside. This green triangles here, they started down over Florida and came into the cross section. Uh, the, the, square, the red squares actually originated out over central, uh, central Mexico, barely touched the Gulf of Mexico, came up, and, and ascended into this region in here. Uh, and then these black uh, triangles, they're kind of almost stratospheric air coming. They come from way back in here. So uh, when you look back at trajectories, you can see that the what, what you see in a single cross section here really has sources that are all over the place, uh, coming from everywhere from uh, Baja, California to Florida and from uh, you know Western Canada on out into the Atlantic. So very, very complicated structure, uh, air, you know, air trajectories moving into this area that we're studying. Uh, and, but if you look at the, these are the same trajectories now, and this is time going this way, time, this is the, this is the arrival time. And you can see that most of the rising motion occurs in the last six hours right in here, uh, these red trajectories and the green trajectories and so on. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at a few other things. Uh, what we're looking at here on the bottom is the normal wind component uh, and the uh, a crosswind component. The contours of the crosswind, okay, and you can see uh, they're going into and out of the screen. A jet stream is over in here. This is clear area right over in this area. Uh, and there's north-northeast flow, air coming out of the cross section over in here. Uh, if we look at the colors parallel to the screen, which are relevant to this band here, we can see that there's some weak convergences, brown and, and so on. I mean, it's very weak, weak convergence right into this region. So you can ask the question, is the weak convergence really driving this? But really what, would, what complicated the interpretation of this is this feature here. What we're looking at here is the W band vertical radial velocity. You can see this is the rain over in here because the raindrops fall at about four to six meters per second where ice falls at about one. So you see this, this blue area just represents particles that are falling as rain. When you look in this banded region, ah, looks like it's actually melting snow in here. Okay, so now we start to get an idea why that reflectivity is so high. We're actually looking at snowflakes that are melting uh, and are not melting completely. They're probably I would take a guess these might be what you might call silver dollar snowflakes or very large wet snowflakes in here. So, so uh, the features that we're interpreting on the scanning radar, uh, have, the, the microphysics are really important uh, and, and how that radar reflectivity is being developed, at least in this storm. Okay, so then my melting snowflakes in there. So finally, what we did 
Uh, I want to watch my time here. What am I doing? Oh, okay, we're doing good. Uh, the uh, finally, what what we did is we looked at the microphysical processes going on in these storms. And so, what I've outlined here are particle growth regimes based on our understanding of what types of particles grow at different temperatures. Uh, and so, the green represents a polycrystalline growth layer. Uh, the purple is a dendritic growth layer. I'm trying to get my mouse going here. Uh, the blue is a plate growth layer. The yellow as a needle growth layer. And then uh, we got the kind of right just above the zero degree isotherm, we got enhanced aggregation and then really down lows freezing. So we flew across this, these areas and made some measurements. This is the P3 operations area in here. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, we crossed both the stratiform region and the convective region. And what I'd like to do now is show you some of the microphysical data analyzed in the statistical reference uh, in these two regions. So we'll divide the region here. I'm going to put the stratiform region on the left, the convective region on the right. What we're looking at are the statistics of the total number concentration as a function of altitude through these layers. So this is the part of uh, the polycrystalline growth layer, the growth layer, the plate growth layer, the needle growth layer, and so on. And what I want you to notice in the stratiform region, as you can see that Initially, at the near the cloud top, we had a range of particle. Uh, this is number concentration, number of of, of particle uh, numbers, and they increased a little bit near the cloud top. And then what happens? Nothing. Okay, you see they they aggregate here, so we have fewer particles, uh, and and basically fall without much change. Okay, there's a little bit of change, but not a lot. Okay, as they fall down. Uh, I'll show you a little bit later on that when we looked at the particle habits in the stratiform region, all the way down, we saw polycrystalline ice crystals, which meant that the particles that are forming up here were just falling and growing. It wasn't any new particle formation. On the other hand, over in the convective region, uh, we see quite a different story. Uh, we can see particles, uh, number concentrations that actually increase quite a bit uh, as we come out of the dendritic growth layer. We start to see more and more particles extending out to uh, particle concentrations extending out to maybe 30 to 50 per liter. So we see new particle formation down low, as well as at the cloud top. You see there's a lot more particles forming at the cloud top because more liquid water, more ice nucleation occurring there. If we look at the super cool liquid water content of those two regions, uh, and you look at the stratiform region here, uh, you can see there's no water. <laughs> It was just, uh, it was all ice all the way down. We didn't uh, see any any ice, any liquid, super cool water at all. Go to the convective region, uh, you can see super cool water present at all the layers, uh, at the cloud top, and then uh, except for maybe this part of the dendritic growth layer, we see super cool water appearing here and there in the storm. Uh, you can see that a little more clearly if you look at this. This is the drop the concentration. Uh, none over here on the stratiform side, and you can see these pockets of super cool water at different areas. Uh, if we look at the, uh, hang on a second. Make this. All right, and uh, let's see, what are we looking at? I, I have something covering up things and I can't see anything right now. Excuse me for a second. All right, here you go. how to make this go away. Give me a second. There it goes. Okay, there you go, finally. <laughs> Sorry, I, there's something appearing on my screen. I can't see anything. All right, total mass. Uh, this is the total mass. And if you uh, look at the two sides, uh, basically you can see that the mass really doesn't change a whole lot through these layers. Particles are just falling where we get into the convective region and you can see that the mass is increasing. So we really see in the microphysics, a big difference between that convective region of the storm and the stratiform region of the storm and the way those particles are evolving. We're seeing ice multiplication processes, particle formation at low levels in the convective region where we're seeing pretty much steady falling particles in the, in the stratiform region as they, uh, without uh, any change in particle habits. And you can see this, this final picture I'll show you here of the uh, particles falling. And you can see these polycrystalline particles all the way down. 
where here we see a menagerie of particles, including needles and, and dendrites and so on as the particles fall and eventually aggregate down low. Okay, so uh, where are we going with impacts? Well, impacts 2021 was supposed to occur in January, February of 2021. We had a little uh, problem with an aerosol. He's one of these guys, uh, probably a lot of them. Uh, and we had to uh, postpone the project. So, uh, but we're going into the field and impacts 22 will be in the field January and February this year. And January 2023, our goal and impacts, if I could use an analogy, is to take the blindfolds off and see the elephant. And that is understand the way that these storms evolve both dynamically, microphysically, kinematically in, in a consistent way that uh, we can use as a basis for providing information that can improve forecasts in the future. So I'll stop there and say thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Professor Rauber. That was great. Um, we do have time for a Q&A, but before we do that, I just want to announce the winner of our book giveaway. Um, I don't have a, a drum set here, so I can't really give that much of a dramatic introduction. But Dan Seckman, congratulations, you won the giveaway. <laughs> you can unmute yourself. Awesome. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Great. Yeah, we'll Never contact you through the email that you provided in the um in the the form. Um and we'll get you in okay. contact with the publisher. All right. Thank you so much. And, uh, Congrats. Dan, yeah, Dan, the uh, uh the book will be as as just went to the printer. So it will be available probably toward the end of the year. Uh, and I've told my publisher, I'll tell my publisher to, uh, to, to, to send it to you. So. Great. Thanks, Bob. Great talk. Yeah, thank you. All right. I'm happy to take questions from anyone. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, they can just unmute themselves now. Or if you do not have a microphone, you can just text your question in the group chat and I will read it out loud. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm so sorry. I missed the beginning of the talk, but um, Dr. and Dr. Harnos alerted me to the talk. Um, and I missed, does impacts stand for something? And why didn't you call it Plows 2 Revenge of the East Coast? So. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, you know, naming a project is always a, uh, is, is always a, a challenge because uh, if you don't name it right, you won't get funded, right? So, so you got to have a got to have a good name. This uh, this name uh, was was uh, considered by uh, PIs, and uh, it does have it is an acronym. Uh, I'm not sure I can remember exactly what it is. Uh, uh, I'll ask one of my impacts colleagues if they can remember the exact acronym. It's uh, investigations of uh, East Coast threatening storms. Uh, I, I I I I can't even remember what the uh, acronym is. Uh, Chip, do you remember anybody out there? Gary, somebody help me out. Yeah, uh, can you hear me, Bob? Oh, Chip, uh, there it is. In if you know it. Oh, uh, I, I looked it up. It's uh, <laughs> investigation of microphysics and precipitation for Atlantic coast threatening snowstorms. Long and, yeah. So there you go. That's uh, that's the acronym. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. Good, good to talk to you again. Yeah. Other questions? Other questions? Hi. Hi. Uh, Yes, Dr. Robert. Uh, I'm Huan Meng. I'm from NOAA. And I was just wondering, uh, you, you showed those uh, uh, snow particles uh, the the images and uh, you compare the stratiform and the convective and I was wondering for the uh, stratiform. Uh, so my understanding is that the the as crystals uh, form at the top of the cloud mostly right and as they fall they probably grow and aggregate. Do you have a uh, uh, information about uh, about at what level those uh, stratiform aggregates start to form? Well, there, there are a couple levels of, I think, aggregation. Well, in the stratiform area or in general? Uh, well, in general and uh, and also for stratiform specifically. Yeah. 
And in, in, in the stratiform area, I think it's somewhat of a continuous process because uh, the polycrystalline crystals have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, kind of arms sticking out, if you like, or crystalline uh, uh, structures that are that, that can connect to one another. So I think there's just a, a, a very slow aggregation process that occurs all the way down. Uh, you tend to see aggregation in two main areas. Uh, the first is uh, is right around the dendritic growth zone. But in the stratiform area, you don't get dendrites growing because uh, you need to have air that's above water saturation for dendritic growth. And there's not just not above water saturation. So, so I think the polycrystallines particles just fall right through those temperatures. Uh, and, uh, but I think they, they slowly collect each other on the way down just because of their shapes. Uh, on, the, uh, on the convective side, uh, you have uh, dendritic growth because it, you get above water saturation in there. Uh, and so you get a lot of uh, dendrites with lots of arms and they can collect each other. And then down low, uh, when, if you have ice multiplication, you'll get needle-like crystals. Uh, and at those temperatures, it's warm enough that they, they kind of stick together and produce aggregates as well. You really get a lot of aggregation if you have a deep melting zone, uh, because in there the, you get a water coating on the crystals uh, and, uh, and they, they stick together like glue in there until they melt. So you can get these big silver dollar type snowflakes that occur down low. So yeah, there's the, the, basically you got mechanical interlocking and, um, and uh, there's a process called sintering where they can fuse together. And then, and then when you get down lower, it's just having that water coating on them makes them, makes them stick together real easily. Okay, okay thank you. Hey, Bob, uh, thanks yeah. a lot for the great talk. This is Liang. My wonder, yeah. are you showing that there is a, a very distinct difference between the straight from region and convective region in the super cold water? So now, yep. is the super cold availability of super cold causes a convective, or is it because the convective causes the super cold water? Yeah. It's it's the convection causes the super cold water. Yeah, basically, it's super cold water in a winter storm. You have to have an updraft that's strong enough that it'll push the, the saturation value up above uh, from ice ice saturation, which which would be the natural equilibrium state. To water uh, to water saturation and then the water super saturation to be able to make water drop. So, uh, you know, we've did we've done calculations on this and and you know at, at temperatures that are reason you know cold temperatures like minus 20 or so, uh, you can push up the water saturation with a meter per second or two meter per second updraft. That's what you actually see at cloud top in the generating cells as well. We see we we've measured super cool water temperatures as cold as minus 32. Uh, in uh, in generating cells, uh, not very commonly, but uh, when you get to about minus 25, minus 20, there's water all over the place in those cells, and the velocities are only about a meter or two per second uh, in there. So upward velocity, only a meter or two per second. The thing is near the cloud top, what makes it work so well is the ice particles by are up there because that's where they first form, and so ice particle ice particle growth is proportional to the particle size. So if we're small. They grow slowly. If they're big, they grow fast. But uh, it's pushing the water saturation fairly easily. But it's the updrafts that answer your question straightforwardly. It's the updrafts that produce the water, not the other way around. Thanks. Hey, yep. Bob. I, uh, this is Chip. I, I have a bit of a philosophical question for you. So I don't know whether there's really a, a, a great answer or or, uh, or not. But I'm curious to your thoughts of uh, where do you go from ha uh, uh, if you where, where's the dividing line between a generating cell and elevated convection? Oh, good question. Okay, so uh, I, I consider generating cells as cloud top, uh, narrow regions of, uh, I'd say kilometer deep, narrow region near cloud top, okay? Uh, uh, where I consider that, and, and this is just, uh, this is philosophical. Okay? I mean, you, it's, it's all elevated convection, okay? I mean, there's no, it, 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 every every one of them is elevated convection. But the, for the terminology, uh, uh, I I tended to make the division is if it's a cloud top process and it's you know within a kilometer or so of the cloud top in a stratiform re otherwise stratiform region, I will call that a generating cell. Where if I see towers that are going up three four kilometers 
uh, or so on, then I'll call it elevated convection. But the truth is, it's all elevated convection. It's just a matter of, uh, you know, what, you're what, talking terminology, about. Yeah. what terminology we want to put with it. But, yeah. Yeah. Th thanks for weighing in. I, I was I was curious what your thoughts were. Yeah. yeah. We have a we have a chat question from Zhi Zhang. I think maybe I need to read it for him. Um, did you observe distinct differences in ice microphysical properties, i.e., ice habit, within the gravity wave induced vertical oscillation regions? In other words, updraft versus downdraft in a high frequency periodic zone. He's wondering if. Let's see here. The in situ cloud probe or camera could capture micro microphysical changes with such a quick switch in vertical motion. Um, in in the, the the clouds I showed kind of in the middle of the talk, they were only observed with radar and not with uh, microphysics. Uh, yeah. Can we observe it? Uh, we, we have the, if, if we fly through those circulations. We can make those, you know, we can look at those differences. I mean, we make we're making these these uh, measurements at uh, well below one hertz, so uh, you know we, we should be able to see those uh, if there are differences, and I suspect there would be. I mean, any and on the downdraft side of it, you're going to get uh, evaporation and uh, downward transport of particles. On the other side, we'll probably see super cool water production. So yeah, you'll definitely see see those differences, but. Uh, but we didn't in the in the, the material I showed you. We did not fly through a strong gravity wave signature to be able to tell you that. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you again for a great talk. Maybe everybody could use their clap hands feature on reactions. All right. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I would have loved to have been there in person, but uh, the next best thing is uh, is to see you all on a screen. So it's yeah. wonderful to see see some folks that I've worked with in the past, and uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Bye bye. Everyone. Bye bye. Everybody.